But if it was super bad, that'd be one thing. It's just okay, like it's there. It's not amazing, but it's not horrible. It's not the worst thing in the world. It's just like the worst kind of reaction you would want a viewer to have. A meh. <laughs> Speaking of Camp Coral, I talk about it a lot on the pod. We're gonna be talking about it again soon, so if you guys wanna check it out, link in the description, of course. It's also in my related channels. After all this time, we are sitting by, waiting, trying to get anything that will confirm or deny our own individual thoughts, fears, biases, to not get much of anything from anyone working on this project. From Hillenberg's passing, to the Super Bowl incident, to Paul Tippett's tweet, to Vincent Waller's tweet, to the sneak peek, to the other spin-offs, a birthday blowout this, sponge on the run that, it's just so empty. Like, I can come on here knowing what little I've seen of seasons 10 to 12 and just feel this empty feeling. Either it's a good episode, but I still feel rather empty after watching it, or it's a bad episode and I feel rather empty after watching it. And think about what I'm talking about here. People have written theories, academic papers, communities, fan art, an entire culture around Spongebob. You'd imagine that the spinoff would be something to watch. But it's not. On a cloudy night, March 4th, I stare at my computer screen not having to speculate no longer. And this is the first thing I'm greeted with. Spongebob! I'm off to summer camp. Spongebob! Through nature I will tramp. Milk is streaming right out of your nose. <sighs> and I understand. I'm sure a lot of what I'm going to say is going to get written off with, get out of here, Boomer. We get it. You were around in 99 and the early 2000s when SpongeBob was cranking out bangers. Of course you're not going to like Camp Coral. Of course you're going to think that the theme song is trash when compared to the original. You don't even like what they're doing now. And are they right? Do I just not get it? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if a whole bunch of people came out and they were like, you know, Jay, I don't agree with you here. I actually do like Camp Coral. With the people that I'm referring to being the people who will give it an open mind, a fair shot, if you will. Because honestly, at this point, I don't know. It's been so long since when I've heard about it that I don't know if I'm going into this with so much bias that I feel like I can talk about it and not feel like I'm peddling someone else's narrative at this point. I mean, yeah, I could say, no, my opinion matters here, but that's a little bit of a cop out. Like what if the new generation sees this as their golden period? Because to me, it just feels so foreign. Or is that supposed to be expected? Because I mean, after 20 years of doing nothing like this, surely this is just a new era. This is just a a new alien feeling like there was no way they could have done this and it not felt foreign right it's like seeing the new Tom and Jerry or Scooby-Doo you know evolving over the years but you always love the classics and you can love the classics of those and appreciate the modern incarnations right right <laughs> I'm hitting the trail. Ugh, well, let's begin with the first episode. Why not? The Jellyfish Kid. It begins with a montage of SpongeBob not in Jellyfish Fields, but in Jellyfish Meadow. I'm assuming either a completely different or a small section within where the jellyfish roam. He's shown a struggling slightly, but ultimately catching a jellyfish, even with said jellyfish applauding his success, only to learn that it's a dream. And that's not bad, right? Like, the idea that if you're going to age all of these characters down, that a good episode concept would be SpongeBob's early attempts at jellyfishing. That's a good concept, it's easy for for everyone to understand. It's also a good episode for fans who are crossing over into this new spinoff, even if it makes other episodes now questionable as far as what is what. I guess you would say they're throwing away the history. Two different shows, two different pieces of history. I get it. However, I do find it interesting that despite being two completely different shows, they'll gladly take any references they can from the other show while denying that the history of that other show exists. Well, who cares, right? This is just a cartoon. Well, fine. How's the animation? How's the art style? How's the music? Patrick, today I'm gonna catch my first ever jellyfish. Tell the ballerinas I caught the gorilla.
Hey, I can say this. I can appreciate the music, how they kept it towards the Hawaiian nautical feel. I appreciate that they put in a decent level of making references throughout this cabin. And you know what? The animation is very smooth. It doesn't have that big drop off from the probably better funded Sponge on the Run. The character designs aren't that bad. They're fine in most aspects, but I feel like I'm missing something here. Ugh, and you know what it is? Let me put a pin here. Let's get all of this out of the way before I begin. Ultimately, up to this point, I do not hate the show. I don't care what anyone else puts out about the show. I'm not a part of the hate brigade. I'm not going to spend multiple months of my life hating every single thing that comes out from this. I don't feel like it hits a threshold that shows like Kid Danger or the 10th season of Fairly Odd Parents hit where it was so blatantly not what the show was about. The team that works on one show works on the other, and you can get that kind of similar feel. But all over the internet, there's just been this looming feeling that anyone supporting the show has this sort of broken loyalty, capitalist bias, or just sheer disrespect for Hillenburg. And as a person who hasn't met the guy but respects what he's done and has taken quite a look at his life from what I read, it sucks. It sucks when you want to give a show a chance like you have done since you have started reviewing, you have given literally every single show a chance and have not written it off, this being a great test towards that considering how much I love Spongebob. And for me to be one of the very few who have not held this man who has gone over the heads of other people, it just really sucks that every single time we do this, we don't know. Ultimately, we won't know what he thinks about the show. We won't get a first-hand experience or any first-hand quotes about what he thinks about this now. And it sucks that every single time we bring up Camp Coral, we gotta bring up Steve. And what pisses me off about the whole thing is that we don't know what he thinks. Unless someone on the team can come out with definite proof, the most you'll ever have is anecdotal evidence which many people grasp onto and develop the foundation of their own opinion of this show off of the experiences of a person who isn't here being unapologetically battered out of someone just because you feel entitled to hear about what truly happened. It's sickening that when I put out just a joking tweet, literally, you wouldn't be able to figure out my opinion based off of this tweet. Just a joke, poking fun at the idea of putting together two groups of people. One group, the idea of those who so strongly feel about this thing that almost all of them will never get a definitive answer from, but would have strong theories and opinions of, juxtaposed with another group of people who feel strongly about a thing and almost none of them will get a definitive answer from, but will have strong theories and opinions about. Like even the person who could have closed the door on everything doesn't want to speak about it. Why? Because a person died. He doesn't want to deal with the emotions surrounding it anymore. So at this point, even if you weren't going to watch, you probably won't watch. And if you were going to watch, then you would have, regardless of whatever that tweet would have been. But if you're on the fence about this, and one of your biggest sources of contention is if Hillenberg would have wanted this, you have to understand that you have to become comfortable with the fact that you won't know. And whether you do or don't watch, don't have that be what you think about when you think about him. He's done so many other things that we don't have to use him as this club of morality. So I really hope that everyone who has subtweeted about this and about myself, that a lot of you are holding your interpretation of a man who has passed away's perspective alongside a team who may never fully finish grieving about this man as your morality shield. And that's really disgusting. Now, that being said, the show really isn't that great either. And I don't need anything other than this episode to show you so. As much as I think the animation here is functional, it's rather unspectacular, and get used to that word. In fact, pretty much everything here works at the base level, but it isn't really that great. It's not something that you would hold in a high regard or showcase as spectacular pieces of animation, even for television. Even when it comes to something that's considerably harder, like how to deal with fluids. Not really that impressive. It's still kind of meh. In fact, one thing I don't understand about all of this is, why is everything so dark? And no, I don't mean dark like, are you happy now dark? I mean, dim. 
Like, I get it. You place these underwater giant flora to simulate the feel of pine trees or whatever trees surround the camp. But camp isn't generally known for being such a dim place. Like, I don't know where their lighting source is and whatever program they use to model all of this stuff, but it really makes everything feel like it should be lit a lot better. Like, they should add more lights. Not only that, but the backgrounds feel lifeless. Maybe it's because of the fact that they don't move, but I see that they tried to salvage whatever happened here. I mean, changing the colors was a good move, but they don't feel right, and I think a lot of that has to do with their unmoving nature. A lot of this just doesn't feel right. It could be because it's now, and I have to get used to it, but for right now, I don't know. But what I do know is we see a lot of returning castmates at Camp Coral, like Larry, Bubble Bass, Kevin, Mrs. Puff, and Camp Master Krabs and his daughter Pearl. Let's hope that Mrs. Puff and Mr. Krabs aren't a thing, or else this love story they have is going to be really messed up. Even Plankton here, and he's the cook? <laughs> One subtle change about all of these characters is that they're all shifted towards meeting the roles of what they will be for camp. So like for example, while Squidward would generally be against doing any kind of work, even if it's for crabs without more pay, here he seems to be rather complicit with everything within the first episode. Not exactly liking everything that goes on, but he's just not walking out of frame and thus he's not going to handle the rest of the episode. Sandy isn't treated like a low-key outsider either. Alongside Patrick, they seem to mingle and coexist with the rest of the camp quite well. Larry and Mrs. Puff being workers at the camp also, I guess, makes sense, but they've taken a back seat within the first episode, more so Mrs. Puff, but both of them retain sort of an interesting perspective of their characters. So then we get our first look at Camp Coral, which I talked about here, and I won't double dip, but essentially they tell the same joke twice, and it's the worst kind of SpongeBob joke. Basically, they dingle a carrot in front of you of what you think is going to happen next, but then they take it away just to pad out the time, and they keep doing that back and forth and back and forth, and once they're ready to give it to you, they'll scold you for not wanting it sooner, like for example here. Patrick goes away, comes back, goes away, comes back, goes away, I already want to turn this off, and then scold Squidward for taking up his time when they were all supposed to be jellyfishing like five minutes ago. One, two, oh, I think I left the stove on! Patrick, we have no stove! What's a hold up? Blow your whistle! Blow my... <laughs> And the main reason I never like this humor is because it always seems to be at the expense of the viewer or people who are protagonist sided. Take Spongebob meets the Strangler for example. The reason why Spongebob inconveniencing the Strangler works beautifully is because not only is this the antagonist, but he's also a bad guy. You're rooting for Spongebob to inconvenience the Strangler because if he doesn't, then the Strangler will strangle Spongebob. To death, maybe. Look, it was a different time. It was funny back then. Please? But here, a lot of times they do it and it comes at the expense of your time to see whatever they're trying to delay takes so long just for an underwhelming payoff. Which makes me feel like I'm the joke. Aren't you an idiot for waiting so long for them to show you nothing twice? Well, after that, we get to what this episode was truly about. Seeing Spongebob catch his first jellyfish. <laughs> That's my college fund! Despite doing some really good animation here, we start to see the tiny things that feel about Spongebob be missed. Look here how they're truly very, very liberal in taking out his iconic teeth, or switching up his eyelashes, or not even giving him like expressions that feel like they would come from Spongebob, or even how this sad Spongebob doesn't look like a sad Spongebob. Yes, different medium, of course, but in this medium, why does it feel like it's just so by the books? You'll have Spongebob nowadays be known for its expressive animation, and then you go to Camp Cora where it looks like they don't want to break out the checkbook for a better looking cry. Oh, you're... <laughs> True, but remember SpongeBob, all the glitters is not all that jazz. Ugh. All right, forget everything I just said in that last whatever. Look, 
why do you even go closer? Like, what is wrong with you? I don't know how to explain how unintentionally gross this is. It looks like he's infected and he's about to start crying out pus. I never want to see that again. It, there's just something wrong with how swollen his eyes are. It doesn't look comical. It looks kind of gross. And it's just not really that pleasing to look at. Never do that again. All is lost for the sponge as he consults the best person that he knows, Squidward. After a really funny sequence of him sitting on Squidward's crushed body, he'd ask him for advice on how to catch jellyfish, appealing to Squidward's ego by calling him the best camper. SpongeBob wouldn't have to do this because Squidward would have already taught him how to catch jellyfish, but I digress. Squidward points him to a cave, and by cave, I mean a free blender asset that they repurposed for the show. Like, it doesn't even look right. I know I paused it for you to see, of course, but I noticed this on the first time I watched this. I don't know if it's the lighting or the colors or the observation that it looks like the cave was just plopped on top of the image, like on its own separate layer, rather than within the same 3D modeling environment. It doesn't help that none of these plants even move slightly underwater. Water. But speaking of questionable 3D models, Mr. Tentacles, it was not a cave, it was a jellyfish hive. Ah! Don't ever put that in my face again! Why does that look so gross? It looks terrifying. But you know, for kids! And of course, the jellyfish hide behind Spongebob in such an unnatural way because for kids. We get towards the latter half of the episode and it turns night and the night sky looks nice. I would even go as far as to say beautiful. When they use individual lights to make everything look better, you don't notice how dark everything is because it makes sense for this time of day and it makes sense for this lighting. This here confirms to me that the show is just not lit the greatest and that if it's nighttime, it's going to look better than the daytime. I don't know why this is passed by so many people and it just continues to look so dim. I wish I can unsee it the way that they did. And I know it's such a weird criticism to have against the show, but here we are in 2021. SpongeBob is very sad to not have caught a jellyfish, but Patrick and Sandy come together to come up with a plan to aid him. Believe it or not, I actually appreciate how, despite being cabin mates, they also really do care. They've shown so far that they actually really do care for the sponge, and I do think that's one aspect that they got right. Of course, they should get it right, so not too much praise, but they did get that right, and I never really felt like they were all just being stringed along a story. We gotta do something! How about we bulldoze the camp, stomp on it, and chop it to pieces and eat it? I don't know what's lower, Patrick's funny joke percentage past like 2017, or the amount of guys who have successfully slid into the DMs of a girl who got a viral tweet. We might need to crunch the numbers on that. Why am I doing this again? Because you feel guilty about getting Spongebob all stung up! What else you got? Cause you will do an amazing job selling the illusion of a jellyfish and you're the best dancer in camp. Two things. One, rewind this video. Squidward's eyes weren't always pink, so that's a weird error. Secondly, it seems like Squidward's character has been relegated to either being used for a slapstick, which in this animation form is just okay, or the guy who you manipulate into helping you out by appealing to his ego. So pretty much modern day Squidward. And I wonder how all of this is going to be incorporated into his camp counselor role. Like, I don't understand why he's that specific role yet. So Squidward turns into a big, ugly jellyfish and baits Spongebob into catching him by doing the ancient ritual of the Buzz Gods. Too bad he forgot to read the ancient scroll to initiate the ritual. Now he has to die. <laughs> So now it's good we're dead, they end up running back to the camp so that the rock monster can consume more children. The monster rampages through the camp, destroying the camp activities, the same ones that Spongebob also destroyed, proving that such a monstrous force can be contained in a well-meaning sponge. We'd even see Plankton and Mr. Krabs chilling with Plankton counting the money. They have such a different relationship here, and it's one of the more subtle things that I probably shouldn't get my hopes too high about, but I, I love it. I'd love to see more of it. I'd love if they were to expand here. I feel like it has to do with the fact that they aren't competing against each other. SpongeBob tries to do the ancient ritual of the Buzz Gods, but he also forgets to read the ancient scroll. Ugh, shame. Shame on you, Sponge. So now he dies too. My name is SpongeBob. You ate 
my camp counselor. I'd appreciate it if you would barf him back up. Yes! Sponge cake. Okay, okay, maybe it didn't happen that way, but I think it would have been funny, right? Right? No? Just me? Fine, whatever. So SpongeBob finds Squidward and they give him a small pep talk and says that he can't die yet. Yes, he uses the word yet. And they decide the best way out of this situation is with a bubble. A bubble that end up saving the day. Now, unlike Squidward's thighs in just one bite, this bubble doesn't pop the monster. In fact, he's just fine and he runs away after Sandy offers the monster Plankton's slop. Although SpongeBob doesn't get the jellyfish badge that he wanted throughout this entire episode catching his first jellyfish the way that he thinks that he'd want to, he gets another badge, quote, a saving the counselor from a monster badge. We'd probably get the first funny joke towards the end of this episode as well, where Squidward is struggling to get out of this helmet, and there's clearly an awkward, nervous jellyfish trying to be confident and woo a mate. I think they got the mannerisms right, albeit again on the unspectacular side, but it says what it needs to do, it gets out, and it's just so succinct and brief and concise that it made me want to see more, but it pulled it away rather than giving me too much, and the entire joke fails. Now, if you aren't mentally defeated from what this episode has offered you, and you're asking about this badge that he got and why it's so specific, well... What is there a saving a counselor from a monster badge? I don't know, Sandy. One day I'm gonna catch me a jellyfish, and when I catch it, I'm going to release it! I guess throughout this whole time, he's been catching jellyfish, but not in his net, and they've been waiting this entire time to be released, even when Spongebob was stung in the hive? Or did they go into him during the hive? And what about when he was being flung around by the rock monster and chewed? You know what? I don't care. Don't care. This episode kind of sucks, and it was an underwhelming mess. Anywho, gets my verses of another controversial mess of a Spongebob thing. Watch out for my upcoming movie review. And as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your patience. Take care. Alpha out.